Okay. Okay, let's take a look at the midterm exam. The first line. The lamps were just being lighted as we paced up and down in front of the house. This should just be waiting. Waiting for the return of its resident. This is a participial construction. The subject of waiting is we. Same subject. One person got very creative and said while we waited, which is correct. Um, I took all correct answers. Uh, but the, the standard answer is to delete being and just to leave waiting. Waiting for the return of its resident. It was just as I imagined it from. Delete Sherlock Holmes's description. Simply delete that. From as a preposition. Can directly take the noun description. Sherlock Holmes's is an adjective. It belongs to or it came from Sherlock Holmes. This is your own so we can ignore this. Uh, preposition plus noun, so you don't need this extra word. As we covered uh, two weeks ago, that introduces a noun clause. A noun clause must be a complete sentence. This is not a complete sentence. So the that is wrong. Oh yeah, so Sherlock Holmes. I took this and adapted it from a scandal in Bohemia. Bohemia uh, It's the Sherlock Holmes story with Irene Adler. Her marriage, remarked Holmes as we paced back and forth in front of the house. Simplifies matters. This one should be. Comma. And lowercase s. This is. Part of this sentence. This is the subject, her marriage. The verb is simplifies and the object is things. So these are two parts of the same sentence. In class, we talked about how you can put the speech tag in the middle of a quotation. We also talked about how you can add extra information between two commas. So this is the beginning of the quotation. This is the speech tag. This is the extra information. And this is the rest of the quotation or all the way here is the rest of the quotation. So the sentence is not finished here. The sentence continues. So it should be comma and then lowercase. I think out of the entire class, only one person got this one right. Now, the question is where we can find the photograph. This should be a period, Julian. This is an indirect question. This is the subject. This is the verb. And this is the object. It is a noun clause. Means it's a, Jew. a noun clause introduced by the word where. So um, we can find the photograph must be a complete sentence because it is a noun clause. And indeed, it is a complete sentence, right? We subject can find verb, the photograph object. It is a complete sentence. So the, the sentence is correct. The ending punctuation is wrong. It should be a period. Where, I asked, take out the comma. If a quotation ends with another punctuation mark, you should not add a comma.
It is too large to be hidden in her dress. We can safely say she does not carry it with her. Say that. We, subject, can say, verb, and this complete sentence is the noun clause that is the object of the bigger sentence. And you can tell that it's a complete sentence. Subject, she, does not carry, verb, it, object. So the sentence is complete. You need to add that in front of a noun clause. In that case, where should we look? The sentence begins here. So you need to add a comma before the main part of the sentence. So I get told you. Another creative answer that I saw is some students moved this information to the back of the sentence. So the answer was, where should we look in that case? This is also correct. Um, but if you move the information to the front, you need to add a comma before the beginning of the main sentence. Maybe her banker or lawyer has it. There is that double possibility. But I do not really think that. Do not or don't. I think this is probably the easiest question uh, on this exam. Right? When you ask, sorry, when you negate in English, folding, you must have an auxiliary verb. If you don't have one, you have to add one. Uh, so you add the do, do not. Why should she hand it to someone else? This is an actual question. It is a direct question. Um, so when in English you ask a question, you should move the first part of the verb phrase to the front before the subject. The verb phrase has two words, should hand, or uh, yeah, should hand. So you move the first word, should, in front of the subject here. Why should she? It must be where she can always get to it. It must be in her own house. He concluded. The standard answer is to add a comma in front of the quotation mark. The idea is that this is a complete sentence, so it should end with a period. But this quotation is part of a bigger sentence. The bigger sentence ends with concluded. So because the entire sentence is not yet finished, we need to change the period into a comma. Some students put the comma outside of the quotation mark. That is incorrect because we are learning American English. American English always puts the comma inside the quotation mark, no exceptions. In British English, they usually put it outside the quotation mark, sometimes inside. Now, I also accepted another creative answer which is if you put a period inside the quotation mark, Julian, and then deleted this, if you take out the speech tag, then it is also correct. Because in this scene, there are only two people, Watson and Holmes, who are talking. So in the, for example, in the previous sentence, there is no speech tag. We know which person is saying which line. So this last quotation, you also do not need the speech tag. So if you put the period inside the quotation mark, 
and then simply ended the sentence after the quotation mark, I also took that answer. But the standard answer is to add a comma before the quotation mark. Questions? OK, so now you know what it feels like to take this kind of grammar exam. For the final exam, the range will include relative clauses, guan dai, relative adverbs, guan fu, coordinating conjunctions, dui dan lian jie ci, conjunctive adverbs, lian jie fu ci, things like however, moreover. And then there will be a kind of unit called complex sentences, fu zha zhi xing. And the idea is that the grammar is correct, but it's really hard to understand. And so we're going to think about how do we turn this sentence into something that is easier to understand. Um, now, you might be thinking, how do you do an exam question on how to make hard sentences easy to understand? And uh, I'm also still thinking about this. So the final exam will mostly, I think, look kind of like this, but there will be a few questions that will be different. Maybe it will ask you to write something. Maybe it will ask you to combine sentences. I'm still thinking about it. But for this exam, I'm sure that after I have explained each answer. You're probably thinking to yourself. Dang, I know that's wrong. Why didn't I see it? And that is the key to having good grammar. It's not uh, when somebody tells you it's wrong, you know how to fix it. It's you notice that it's wrong and you know how to fix it. Most of you in the future will have to write in English. I'm guessing a lot of the time you can use ChatGPT. But when you can't, when you have to write something very quickly or it's something that AI doesn't know how to handle, you have to be able to see if your sentence is correct. Even when you use AI and you need to change some things in the sentence, you need to know whether your changes have correct grammar. That is the skill that this class is trying to help you learn. So you can take the exam back. You can download the clean version from Moodle. You can practice a few times to see whether you can actually find the mistakes. Um, and you can also go back through the handout or you can go through the new handout I'm going to pass out later and also practice finding the mistake because that is the most important thing. Questions? Okay, now some of you might feel like you don't know whether you're going to pass this course. So here are some suggestions that you can do. Uh, first of all, uh, now you know how to better prepare for the final exam. Another thing you can do is um, in this class, attendance is worth 40%. I only take away points if you have an unexcused absence. Uh, if you have an unexcused absence, I will take away uh, for every week. I will take away six points out of 40. That's not right. 12 points out of 40, which is 15%. Uh, so it's quite heavy. Now, if you do have unexcused absences, you can change that. You can go to the student affairs office and ask to do school service. And for, I think, each hour or maybe two hours of school service, they will turn one unexcused absence into personal leave. If you want to go to school, you can go to school and go to school. 
然后呃 ，Azure 服务会单位换算，会把旷客变成市价，这样就不会扣到出席率。呃、uh, ，and one more thing you can consider is to do this last chance quiz. It will only open for you after class on week 18, so after the final exam. First of all, I want to make sure you still try your best during class, right? I don't want you to think, oh, I can just take this and I don't have to pay attention. Um, but also the exam is, or sorry, this quiz is something that you do not have to prepare for. It's a very open-ended kind of question. And the more you pay attention in class, the easier it will be to answer this question. Also, the lower your original score, the harder you will have to work to make up the difference between your score and 60. Uh, 就你平常上课越专心，这个到时候这个测验会越好写。然后如果你原始成绩，你原始成绩越低，你这个中东就要越认真写。嗯、um, ，So again, this is here just in case. Hopefully, you don't have to use it, but it's there just in case. Um, if you think you are going to pass, you can also get a higher score by doing this extra credit assignment. Um, I decided just to open it up. You can do this whenever you want. But if your original score is lower than 60, I will not count this extra credit. Okay, so do you have questions about uh, raising your score? I think with all of these options, you should be able to pass. Okay, so um, if you did not yet get back your midterm exam, I will call your name again before the break. For now, let's move into this week's um, unit. Relative clauses. So if you look at the syntax file on Moodle, I think I skipped over this part during week one. This is on the 30th page. It's called page 168. A relative clause is a way to combine two sentences. We know that a complete English sentence only allows for one subject, one verb, and one object. But what if you want to say something that includes more than that? You need two subjects, three subjects. You need another verb. You want to talk about two things that are connected. Well, one option is to use a relative clause. A relative clause connects two sentences that have or that share some kind of noun. 两句之间共用一个名词，某一种名词。And you can use that connection to put these two sentences together. This is something that we don't have in Chinese. And so my experience tells me that most students in Taiwan have some trouble learning this. So please pay attention. Because this kind of sentence is very, very, very common in English. For some reason, uh, native speakers of English can just get these sentences. Um, so even if you don't use them, you must be able to understand them. So let's take a look at this example. Uh, this is not a complete sentence. So uh, this is the noun phrase. This is the subject of a bigger sentence. Hmm. OK, let's turn this into a complete sentence and then we can we can observe what's going on. So let's see. What's the guy's name? Hadassa. Okay. 
So these two sentences, you can see that they have a noun in common. They both have the friend and it is the same friend. There are two ways to combine these sentences. You can uh, put number two into number one, or you can put number one into number two. Let's put number two into number one. So, sorry, sorry, yeah, yeah. So if we put number two into number one, we start from the bigger sentence. The first sentence. And you write it out, just copy it out as normal. But when you hit the shared noun, that is where you put in the other sentence. Now, uh, a relative clause uses a relative pronoun. It's a pronoun, so it is a noun. Here we can use that. So the word that actually has a meaning, and the meaning is the friend. So if this is the beginning of sentence two, we have already written this part. So we go back to the beginning and write out the rest of the sentence. We have finished sentence two, so we go back to sentence one and we finish writing out sentence one. And that is a sentence with a relative clause. Sentence one, the friend was not there. Sentence two, Hadassah visited the friend. The friend is this one, visited the friend. Uh, and we put the two words that are the same, we put them together, and we change the second time into a relative pronoun. That's it. This is the basic concept. You can think of it as like a, a door hinge, men suan. It's where one sentence turns and becomes another sentence, and then you go back and finish the first sentence. Now, because this example, the noun is a person, so you can also use the word who. Who is reserved for people. And that brings us back to the syntax page here. Uh, this noun phrase is all the way up to before the verb, right? So this is the noun, the subject. This is the relative clause, which is an adjective. This is xiongzi. A relative clause works like an adjective. And then the main verb was not. And then you finish the sentence. So this example is only up to the end of the noun phrase, including the adjective part. The friend who Hadassah visited. So the original sentence, if you remember the C, tells us this should be a uh, sentence. Hadassah visited a friend. This originally was a complete sentence. We're putting this complete sentence into another sentence. Um, so as I said, you move the shared noun. Up to the front right next to the same noun. But look at this logic. The sentence has a subject, has a verb, has an object. The order changes, but the object is still there. The who is still a pronoun. It means something. It is the object of this part of the sentence. So you don't have to add something else to fill this space. It's simply changing the order. You have not 
taken anything out， 你只是改变句子顺序，所以不用把东西补进去，东西都还在，只是顺序不一样而已。呃、uh, ，so many people will feel like something is missing at the end， right？ visited， visited what？ and so they want to add something here， but actually this thing simply has moved over， it is still part of the sentence。So this is the basic logic of the relative clause. We put two into one. Now let's put one into two. How do we do this? Uh, two is the bigger sentence, so you start from the beginning. And you just write out the sentence like normal. And then we meet the common word, the shared word. So then we go back and we put in. The other sentence. The other sentence uh, shares the word friend, so we add. A relative pronoun. We have turned friend into who. Then we write out the rest of the sentence. Was not there. OK, we have finished the inside sentence now we go back to the outside sentence and we copy the rest of this sentence done hadasa is the subject visited is the verb a friend is the object and who was not there describes the friend it is an adjective that describes the friend so in Chinese, we can still say this. It just feels kind of weird. Uh, that part was not there. Uh, so you, if you listen to the Chinese, you know that it's an adjective. Uh, you should remember that when you're looking at a relative clause. The main difference between the English version and the Chinese version is that in the English version, you can keep adding new relative clauses to the end of the sentence. Um, well, this sentence is kind of short, so it's not easy with this sentence, but if you have enough nouns in the sentence, you can keep adding stuff. But if you translate that directly into Chinese, it will sound like some some other, some some other, some some other, some some other, the. Uh, and it just sounds very crazy in Chinese. So for this kind of sentence, you do have to pay attention to the English grammar. Um, I think it might be easier to understand this kind of sentence. Um, if you think about it as like a really long sentence. When you read a really long sentence in any language, your brain has to process what you're reading before the end of the sentence. Usually when we read, we only stop to process when we reach the end of a sentence. But for really long and complicated sentences, you have to process while you read. I think that's what you have to do for relative clauses. Process the information while you are reading the sentence. Because if you wait for the end of the sentence and you try to put everything together, your brain will probably use the Chinese logic and uh, it won't work. So you have to process while you read. OK, so uh, there are three. There are three main. Oh, let's say two. There are two main words that can be used as relative pronouns. That and which. So when you combine two sentences and there's something, there's some noun that both sentences have, when you write in the second time, change that word into either that or which. Now, there are some differences between these two words. Um, when you add a relative clause. There are 
two kinds of logic. The information that you put in the middle, right? This part. We know the sentence is talking about a friend who is not there. The middle part, Hadassah visited the friend. Do we already know this information? Or when we mention the subject, the friend, do we already know that this friend is the one that Hadassah visited? Or is this new information? If it is new information, you just leave it like this. It's on the same level than Ji Yang. And in this case, usually we use the word that. You can also use which if you want to, but the main choice is that. If it is not new information, if we already know this, then we treat it like extra information. We just talked about on the midterm exam, extra information, you can surround it with commas to tell the reader that the information is uh, something that you add in. It is not essential important information. This is extra information. In this case, we know which friend you're talking about. You're simply adding this extra information. If you take this part out, we still know which friend you're talking about. And in this case, your main choice will be which. So if it's essential information, if it's important information, the usual choice is that. If it is extra information, the usual choice is which. Uh, there are some exceptions, but you won't run into them very much. So, if you don't have these two commas, this tells us this is important, essential information. So if we take out this part, then we don't know which friend you're talking about. Only when you tell us that it is the friend Hadassah visited, only then do we know which friend you're talking about. Um, the main, we'll, we'll talk about the, Mm. How much information should I give you? Should I confuse you? I'll talk about it next week. Yeah, there, there is a hard rule about that in which, but it's kind of complicated and it's more related to what we're going to talk about next week. So for now, just remember for essential information, usually you would use that. For extra information, usually you would use which. All right, let's do some let's do like two more examples and then um i'll let you guys practice you know what i think we, i should uh guide you to do these extra examples after the break that way after we finish you can immediately move into the practice okay so um let's take a slightly longer break uh, and I'm going to call your names to hand out your midterm exam if you have not yet gotten it.
OK. OK, let's practice some of these sentences. John and I went to the dance. The dance was in Chicago. So if you put sentence two into sentence one, sentence two, so you begin with the dance. The dance is the shared noun, so you put in a relative pronoun here. Let's say that this is essential information, so we use that. Then you copy out the rest of the first sentence. John and I went to. So we have finished the first sentence and we copy out the rest of the second sentence was in Chicago. And that gives you a complete sentence with a relative clause in the middle. This describes the dance. Now, because this is essential information, if you delete this part, we don't know what dance you're talking about. You're talking about the dance that you and John went to. But if you put in the two commas, then we even if you take out this extra information, we still know which dance you're talking about. This is just to give you more information that is extra. So that's two into one. Let's do the first sentence into the second sentence. How should we begin? Samakaisu. How do we begin putting sentence two? Sorry, sentence one into sentence two. We We start from the outside sentence. Right, we put one. <laughs> Sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm sorry. It's not your fault, it's my fault. Yeah. So this should be two into one. Sorry about that. Sentence two into sentence one, so sentence one is the bigger sentence. So we start with the bigger sentence. John and I went to the dance. Dance is the shared noun. So you replace the second one with a relative pronoun. Let's say that. And you continue finishing the inside sentence was in Chicago. Then you go back and you finish the outside sentence. Does that make sense? Good. Um, so again, uh, if this is essential information, if we take this out and we don't know what dance you're talking about, you do not add a comma. If it is extra information, if you take it out and we still know what dance you're talking about, you add the comma. So this is extra information. OK, let's try. Three sentences. Um, or rather, I'll show you how to do this. Um, so of three sentences, there are a number of different ways to combine them. Let's look at the shared nouns. Going on the means this one. Winter clothes, winter clothes. And then you have price and price. So we're going to use these words to put these sentences together. Here's one way to do this.
So the repeated word is winter close. So that's where you put in the pronoun, relative pronoun. So this comes from the second sentence. So we go back to the beginning of the second sentence and you continue copying out uh, the rest of the sentence and you skip the part you already put in. Right? This has only moved to the front. How does it wait? So you can skip it. Uh, and again, we meet a word that is repeated. Um, when you put in the third sentence, it takes a little bit of logic. This price is low. It is usually high. So this is unusually low. Right? In the logic of this sentence, the price is low, even though it is usually high, so this must be unusually low. OK, take some time to look at this sentence. When winter game, we put on our winter clothes, which our friends had brought us to buy at a low price, which was unusually low. Price, price. You can combine this in another way. So this begins with the second sentence. Our friends had brought us to buy some winter clothes. Uh, up to this point, it is the same. Uh, but now we're putting in the first sentence. So this goes first, that. And then the main sentence we put on when winter came. We put on when winter came. Because you can put this at the front or at the back. The meaning is the same. After we finish writing out the first sentence, we go back to the bigger sentence and we finish writing this out at a low price. And then price and price. Uh, so that's this price becomes that. Uh, was unusually low. Now you can also, as I said, move the when to the front. And it would look like this. Right, when winter came, comma. So when winter came, comma. But because this is not the beginning of the sentence, you have to separate it from the rest of the sentence. So there also has to be a comma here. Because you have moved this from its original place, you have moved it somewhere else. So you need to use those two commas to tell the reader this part has been moved. I think we can combine this a few other ways also, right? So for example, um, the, as I don't want to use the brain power, but like these are the few main ways you can combine these three sentences. Think about how you would translate this into Chinese. Our friends had brought us to buy some winter clothes that we put on when winter came at a price that was unusually low. 
I don't think you can translate this into one Chinese sentence uh, without making it very, very confusing, right? Something like. Uh, uh, 我们朋友带我们去用非异常低的价格买一些冬天来时我们穿上的冬季衣服. Very weird, but it makes sense in English. Uh, and that is the important point about relative clauses. It really is English logic. Um, and I think for all three of these sentences, the Chinese order is probably the same. But because in English we are combining sentences using different hinges, sunyo, uh, so the order can be a little bit different, but the meaning will be the same. So how do you decide what should be the outside sentence and what should be the inside sentence? Well, the most important idea should be the outside sentence. The sentence that you put inside becomes an adjective. So it looks less important. The most important sentence should be the outside sentence. So that's the uh, those are the main ideas about relative clauses. There are two variations that uh, you should know about. The first one is called a cleft sentence. Um, let me let me move this to. So it's called the cleft sentence because you have a verb called cleave. And cleave means to cut in half. So this kind of sentence is a sentence that has been cut in half. It's a car that we want to buy, not a bike. The original sentence is we want to buy a car, not a bike. So look at this. Subject, verb, object. But after doing this weird thing, you put the object in front and then the subject, sorry, subject, and then the verb. This kind of sentence emphasizes the thing in between the its and the that. In terms of grammar, it's a relative clause. It is a car is the main sentence and inside the relative clause is we want to buy the car. But when you read this sentence in its natural habitat, it is simply emphasizing the thing at the front. So you can also uh, emphasize something else, right? It's we that want to buy a car. And the second half would be like, not them, we. Uh, in Chinese, uh, instead of saying, 我们要买车, you would say, 我们要买的是车. You're emphasizing that part of the sentence. Right? Uh, this is an adjective, right? So, 我们要买的是 it's exactly the same as in Chinese. Uh, and then one last variation. This is something that many Taiwanese students get wrong. Um, if you want to say, like, okay, so if you have a sentence in Chinese that begins with yo, was mayo. This one says mayo ren. But we don't use the word have, we use the word there is or there are depending on singular or plural nobody is singular danshu so we use is there is nobody mailren now in this sentence the word there is simply for grammar it does not have a meaning as 
and you can tell that there is no meaning because if you want to say not being male, you would say there is nobody there. This one is a place, but this one is just for grammar. Now, you can also use this kind of sentence to emphasize something. Uh, and you and it turns into a relative clause. So this sentence, there is nobody who wants to take another test. The first sentence, the main sentence, there's nobody. The relative clause. Nobody wants to take another test. And you put this sentence into this sentence. So in Chinese, this is something like. Uh, so here you are emphasizing the fact that there is nobody. Otherwise, you can simply just say. Nobody wants to take another test. Right. By putting uh, the by turning the first part into a their sentence and then finishing the sentence with a relative clause, you are emphasizing this part. The logic is the same as the cleft sentence. Now, uh, up to this point, do you have questions? OK, I have one more thing to tell you. Sometimes you will see a sentence like this. This uh, hmm. uh, that's not a good one. Let me let me think of a, a better sentence. Yeah, OK, so there's a that here. But look at the part of the sentence after the that. We can learn grammar so well. We is the we is the subject. Can learn is the verb. Grammar is the object. Is this a complete sentence? The Jewish ma? Yes, it is. So this that is not a relative pronoun. It is a noun clause. As the kai means is the So this that this word has no meaning. It is just for grammar. In fact, this sentence means exactly the same as. This sentence, these two are exactly the same. There is just one extra word. It. Therefore, we know that the word it is also meaningless. You would use this kind of sentence when your subject is too long. Right? If you look at this sentence, that begins a noun clause. We can learn grammar so well. And this is the subject. Is is the verb, and then the, the word great finishes the sentence. So if your subject is a really long noun clause, English has a way to make this sentence less confusing. And it is by putting your subject at the end. And instead. Use a meaningless it at the beginning to replace the subject. Um, so in Chinese we call this shu zhu ci. It doesn't mean anything. The the is is still here. Right, the is is the main verb. But the subject is actually here. Uh, and remember, this is not a relative clause. It is a noun clause. OK, so that's the basic introduction. Let's take a look at your new handout. Your brand new handout.
Page one. Find where you should put in the word who. Or if you want, you can put in the word that. All you have to do is see where to put it. Uh, four questions. I'll give you 90 seconds. OK, let's compare answers. Bayanchi. Di wu hang pai. Di si zong pai. Tang yao ling. Mei yao, zai wang xia yi ge. Wang xia. Wang qian han. Question two, where do we put the who? Good, here, people who sat next to us at the soccer game. I liked the people. This is a complete sentence, subject, verb, object. Um, so the missing idea is people, right? Pe somebody sat next to us. So we add the who here. Good. Number three. Uh, yeah. Where do we put the who? Good. People who paint houses for a living are called house painters. So the complete sentence is people are called house painters. And in the middle, we get the idea of who these people are. They, right, the who, paint houses for a living. Good. Number four, D pi D baga. Yes, number four, where do we put the who? Here, I'm uncomfortable around married couples who argue all the time. Good. Uh, so this is a complete sentence, right? I'm uncomfortable around married couples. Uh, and then we get more information about which kind of married couples, the kind that argue all the time. Good. Uh, so question five, where do we put the who? Good. Uh, while I was waiting at the bus stop, I stood next to an elderly gentleman who started a conversation with me about my educational plans. Uh, so yes, this is a complete sentence and it finishes the sentence. The second or the inside sentence is this person started a conversation with me, blah, blah, blah. So we use the word who to connect these two. Good job, guys. Next. Um, uh, let's skip this one. Page two. T 
10 classic questions about correcting mistakes. These are all mistakes related to relative clauses. Um, I'll give you five minutes. OK, let's compare answers. Question one. Wang Shuhui. Zai Ma. Li Xianghua. Question one. Where's the mistake? Good. There were many people who 
didn't have money. Number two, thousand. Thousand. No. Uh, Lin Yanzhen. Also no. Lin Yanzhen. Hi, number two, where is the mistake? So I enjoyed the book. This is a complete sentence. And the book has been moved next to uh, the same word. And then the rest of the sentence, you told me to read the book. So you don't need this. You get it? Good, so uh, the it is extra. You already have a, an object. The object has just been moved. Number three. Good, yes. Who is already the subject? The it means the man. So you don't need to add another subject. The he is extra. I still remember the man who taught me to play the guitar when I was a boy. Good. Number four. Uh, Jasmine. Gone again. Gone to Kanda. Wee Yes, number four. OK, I showed my father a picture of the car. This is a complete sentence. So this is the beginning of the relative clause. It's missing a that. That I'm going to buy. Uh, I'm going to buy the car, right? So the car moves here, becomes that. So this it is extra. So. The car that I'm going to buy as soon as I save enough money. Does that make sense? Good. Number five, poison. Ah, you just got to go. Hmm. Liu Yongning. Yes, number five. Good. The woman who I was talking about, right? You have two abouts. The first one is extra. Good. Number six, Lai Wenxing. Good. The people who appear in the play are amateur actors. Right. So the people are, and the middle part is the relative clause who appear in the play. Number seven. Sure. Okay. Very close. I don't like to spend time with people who, that's correct, but this who means people. People is plural, so this should be lose, who lose their temper easily. Make sense? Good. Number eight. Orange it. Yes, number eight. Uh, he took pictures of people. OK, this is one part. Who? Do we need to change anything else? Who means people? People 
is plural. So this needs to be were good. Uh, number nine. Uh, Qin Yijie. Yes, number nine. Okay, so yes, this is extra. Uh, because the sentence begins here. This is the subject. Estimate is the verb. Everything in the middle is a relative clause. Now here, did you say work or works? Work, good, because who means people. People is plural, so this should be work. And number 10. Lucky number 10. Who should I call? Yao Ziqing. Okay, so this begins with in, and then there's a comma. So this is not the main sentence. The main sentence begins here. Subject, an old man. Verb, was playing. Object, a violin. So this is a trick question. This is not a relative clause. The who is extra. Uh, okay, any questions about these? Okay, let's stop here today. If you already have your midterm exam, you are free to go. If you do not yet have your midterm exam, please wait for me to give it back to you. <laughs>